Bala sir, may I begin? Just one minute. Yeah, Professor Mishra would be joining us in uh, a few minutes, uh, but we can begin. Awesome. So hello and welcome back everyone to the finish line of this uh, three-day event. Um, you know, when we started off, we started off with a blank paper and endless possibilities. And now we have a version of that possibility in front of us. <laughs> so everyone, again, I would like to welcome everyone uh, back to the third and final day, uh, the valedictory uh, address by Dr. Dumarinov of the International Conference on Philosophical Counseling sponsored by ICPR and organized by the Department of Philosophy and Department of Education, New Delhi, uh, University of Delhi. Um, I um, have personally had a great time during the conference. There's been so much insight, so much sharing, so much, uh, so many new perspectives that we, you know, all gotten to share with each other. And the online mode has um, somehow uh, facilitated a very timely uh, you know, management of the entire conference. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to invite a fellow uh, member of the organizing committee, Madhulika, to come and share her views on the conference and, as well and, and kind of encapsulate the conference uh, for everyone present here. Madhulika? Yes. Thank you, V. Uh, hello, Professor Lu. Um, sorry, just a second. Uh, so let us recapitulate the last three days of this conference. So uh, we Madhika, began... your video, uh, could you switch on your video, please? Uh, I am facing some technical glitch. There's some internet connectivity issue. Please don't mind me, but yeah. Uh, just to begin again, I like to recapitulate the last three days of this conference. So we began with Dr. Pere Grimes' uh, enthusiastic participation as a keynote address. And we were just expecting a brief appearance by him, but instead he stayed for the inaugural as well as his presentation. Even at the age of 99, he was full of charm and charisma. We further proceeded with the interesting sessions by our speakers and chair, which set the tone of the conference. The parallel sessions reflected intriguing commitment in the eyes of the participants and the chairs were equally forming engagement in their respective sessions. With some debatable intellectual positions by Professor Peter to some heated conversations with Professor Oscar, the second day of the conference took an interesting route where the participants enjoyed and yet were astonished by some important insights. The speakers reflected greatly on the methodologies by giving apt case studies for participants to get the real picture of philosophical counseling. Moving forward to the last day, which is today, we unraveled the debatable areas of philosophical counseling, which included both psychological and philosophical arguments which were exactly on logger's head with each other. However, they eventually moved to a neutral ground of accepting limitations of individual practices. I would now yeah, like to invite Professor, uh, I think uh, Charudi, we should invite Professor Lu, and then we can later move on to hearing our participants. Sure, definitely. Um, so keeping that in mind, just a brief introduction about uh, you know our um, esteemed uh, Professor Lou Marinoff here, who has been kind enough uh, to make a presence and give a valedictory uh, address to all of us. A Commonwealth scholar, originally from Canada, he studied theoretical physics at Concordia and McGill universities and earned a PhD in philosophy of science at University College London. Following postdoctoral research at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and a lecture, lectureship at the University of British Columbia. He joined the City College of New York in 1994, where he is currently Professor of Philosophy. Professor Lu publishes in Decision Theory, Computer Modeling of Rational and Moral Agency, Global Ethics, Philosophy of Science, Chinese Philosophy, Indian Philosophy, Buddhism, and Philosophical Practice. 
He's the founding president of the American Philosophical Practitioners Association, APPA, and editor of its journal, Philosophical Practice. Uh, Professor Liu has authored several internationally best-selling books that apply philosophy to everyday life, including Plato Not Prozac, which has been translated into 27 languages. Uh, Professor Liu collaborates with think tanks and leadership forums, such as the Aspen Institute, BioVision in Lyon, Festival of Thinkers Abu Dhabi, Horace Zurich, the Institute for Local Government at the University of Arizona, Soka Gakka in International Tokyo, Strategic Foresight Group Mumbai, and the World Economic Forum Davos. He has appeared in three documentary films, two of which feature professional sports, a three-time Canadian Open Table Hockey Championship 1978-79-80 and US Open Championship 2015. He continues to play and promote sport as conducive to developing attention span and sportsmanship in children, an antidote to ADHD and bullying alike. His hobbies include photography, classical guitar and tennis. Uh, Professor Lu, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could go on and on, but uh, we want to hear more from you and we are so um, happy and uh, we feel honored and privileged to have you here. Uh, please, Professor Lu, on to you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Charu and Bala, Vikash and all the organizers. It's wonderful to be with you uh, this evening in Delhi, this morning in New York and wherever else you are in the world, Andre in Brazil and Li Zhang in, in China. Uh, I'm going to speak to you about some larger scale issues this morning uh, that pertain to both the possibilities that the pandemic has opened up for philosophical practice, which are considerable and are just underway as we have made this reset to a new kind of normalcy. Uh, but there are also some problems inevitably that are associated with these developments. And I want to get you as philosophers to think more carefully about some of the problems and how in addressing these problems we can actually serve the mission uh, broadly construed a philosophical practice. So I'm going to read a paper to you, uh, and uh, with uh, with uh, the help of Vikash, we'll be. Um, uh, don't no no. You're not supposed to share this. No 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 no. Please no no no. I'm asking you to share the PDF slides, not the not the text. Uh, but don't start the slides yet. <laughs> Obviously, we haven't rehearsed. Yes, but stop this now, okay? Uh, that's the title page, and uh, please stop the share, uh, and I will tell you when to start the share, and the share will begin on the first slide after the page, okay? So we'll try to coordinate this uh, on the fly, and please uh, bear with us as we, as we coordinate the images and the text, all right? So here is the talk, and uh, obviously the, there should be some time for our interaction afterwards. Now, as we enter our third year of COVID-19, uh, we are able to reflect on its emergent transformations of the global village for better and worse, and to inquire as to how these transformations are affecting the growth and evolution of philosophical practice. No matter which dimension of the pandemic's effects we explore, be it medical, psychological, educational, socioeconomic, or political, we immediately perceive that applied philosophy has enhanced relevance, whether in descriptive, interpretative, or indeed prescriptive roles. This talk will focus on an overarching technological feature of the pandemic's effects, which has operated and continues to operate significantly in all the foregoing dimensions. That feature is the virtualization of all possible formerly real human transactions and interactions in tandem with the intensification of virtual transactions and interactions previously in place. Even prior to the pandemic, the digital revolution had been transforming human self-conception and human interaction in unprecedented ways, not all of them salutary or conducive to well-being. For example, the malign effects of social media on young people particularly and the brazen censorship of nonconformist or dissident views by tech oligarchs were already being noted and protested by free thinkers, public intellectuals, consumer advocates, and assorted pundits, including yours truly. 
these and kindred issues have taken a temporary back seat to the exigencies of the pandemic, which at the same time has fostered their ongoing exacerbation. Operationally, it amounts to this. The pandemic has displaced a significant proportion of formerly real human interactions and transactions, real meaning embodied beings inhabiting physical spaces in synchronous times, to virtual human interactions and transactions, virtual meaning disembodied beings inhabiting digital spaces at desynchronous or indeed asynchronous times. Said a different way, the vital forces that had formerly animated and infused real human interactions and transactions, forces such as physical presence, personal gravitas, emotional palpability, sensory impression, pheromonic reception, body language, and social engagement have all been sublimated into virtual versions that pale beside the real. Descartes' cogito, itself an irreconcilable divorce of mind from body, has been further impoverished to pipo ergo sum, I tweet, therefore I am. Uh, please share the first slide, Vikash, if you would. Yes, pipo ergo sum, and this is from the Latin uh, pipare, meaning uh, 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 how small birds tweet in the trees. Yes, pipare, to tweet in the trees like a small bird. So pipo ergo sum is the, is the current human condition as far as virtuality is concerned. There is a name for this region into which humanity has been summarily displaced, and it was coined exactly one century ago, in 1922, by the prescient French Jesuit and scientist Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. Next slide, please, Vikas. Uh, Chardin called it the noosphere and defined it as the thinking envelope of Earth. For Chardin, the noosphere has theological and teleological implications. His Russian friend, scientist Vladimir Vernadsky, developed his own interpretation of the noosphere. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, which he reconceived in a less mystical and more scientific light. Uh, Vernadsky's father was an economist to the imperial court, and his mother was a music teacher. He had a very interesting life. Um, but in any case, he met Chardin in Paris and developed a parallel interpretation of the noosphere. The noosphere supervenes on the Earth's biosphere. Please, next slide. Uh, the noosphere supervenes on the Earth's biosphere, which itself supervenes on the geosphere. Simply stated, the geosphere is a bedrock whose constitutive elements and fortuitous solar orbit, the so-called Goldilocks zone, were conducive to the emergence of the biosphere. The biosphere is a region overlapping habitable parcels of the geosphere's land, sea, and air in which myriad life forms have evolved amidst alternating proliferations and mass extinctions. The noosphere is a medium of shared consciousness that emerged from the rational consciousness of the most conspicuous of these terrestrial life forms, namely ourselves. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the geosphere, again, is shaped by physical forces. The biosphere is shaped by vital forces and natural selection, and the noosphere is shaped by noetic forces and synthetic selection, which is an analogous uh, form of evolution that pertains to culture uh, exclusive of biology. I can say more about that later, but I will not focus on that today. So before pursuing our analysis of the geosphere, or the noosphere, excuse me, and the emerging role of philosophical practice within it, uh, we would do well to ponder the vastly different time scales on which these three spheres are configured. The geosphere and its solar systemic neighborhood required billions of years to evolve to the point where they could support a viable biosphere. While the oldest sentient beings and their descendants, e.g. sharks and rays, have endured for a few hundred million years, the primates are only tens of millions of years old, Homo sapiens only 200,000 or so years. The noosphere itself was christened or defined only a century ago, 
and it required the digital revolution some decades later to begin to populate it. Since then, its expansion and population have grown exponentially and have yet to attain their limiting potentials. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, okay, the one after that. We'll come back to the fang in a moment. Yes, this one. So we, you can see the uh, proliferation of data in the noosphere from this graphic. And please understand that the vertical time scale is logarithmic. It's nonlinear. Each increment on the vertical time scale is 10 times its previous increment. So this is an absolutely incredible explosion of data. And it's, in fact, the sum total of human shared consciousness. So uh, consider that the first email was sent by Roy Tomlinson in 1971. And by 2020, more than 300 billion emails per day were being sent, amounting to more than one trillion emails that year. Consider that the first website was launched in 1991, and that by 2021 there were 1.88 billion websites in existence, plus or minus, because they also, uh, you know, emerge and become extinct in their turn, some of them. Similarly, the size, scope, and scale of operations of the so-called FANG, uh, the tech tyrannosaurs, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google, are all increasing exponentially. In December 2019, uh, there were 10 million participants per day worldwide in Zoom meetings. Uh, and yeah, this is the fang, and we'll say more about them later. They are devouring smaller enterprises as we speak, and also, as we will see, uh, curating the data that they permit to be exchanged on their platforms. And this is a very serious problem to which I will return. In December 2021, there were 300 million Zoom participants per day. Uh, this represents, in two years of the pandemic, an astronomical increase of 2,900%. The average American is now spending f five to six hours per day on a mobile device, running apps that interface with all the foregoing platforms, among countless others. So one net effect of the pandemic has been to further exponentiate the growth of all these digital technologies, which have in very short order fundamentally and in some cases irreversibly altered the ways in which humans interact, both with themselves and with others. In a most fundamental sense, the virtualization of a slate of formerly real life and real time human interactions amounts to the teleportation of human consciousness and its shared expression out of the geosphere, i.e. beyond the body, and out of the biosphere, i.e. beyond the embodied social matrix, and lock, stock, and barrel into the newosphere. This thinking envelope of Earth is a medium that transmits, receives, reflects, filters, curates, minds, tracks, exploits, and algorithmizes digitized emanations of disembodied and desocialized consciousnesses themselves. The rapidity of the newosphere's evolution and the transformation of uh, consciousness is occasioning and also driving uh, uh, these are things that are unprecedented in our species. If Homo sapiens is of the order of 200,000 years of age, uh, then all but the last 9,000 years or so of human cultural evolution were based on oral traditions. Uh, these were remarkably stable if technologically non-innovative traditions. Could you please show the next slide? This is the oral tradition, and it's the oldest of the four cultural traditions that we can trace in the evolution of humanity outside of biology. <clears throat> so uh, the oral tradition was remarkably stable, and it still is. Uh, but it was superseded, of course, by the written tradition. And uh, if you could show the next slide, please. Uh, the, the, the oral tradition was stable, but technologically largely non-innovative. It was suddenly superseded uh, by the prodigious written tradition and its incessant innovations, eventually including the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the written tradition, in turn, was largely superseded by the visual tradition. Next slide, please. Yes, the visual is compassed by the invention of movies initially, but television predominantly. Prior to television, families used to gather around the radio listening to their favorite broadcasts. 
But following the mass production of television in the 1950s and the proliferation of channels and programs, TV supplanted radio as the technological focal point of family gatherings. Note that television did not render radio extinct. The oral tradition still survives in the shadow of the visual, but in diminished capacity. Lately, it is making a comeback via audiobooks. Neither did the visual tradition render the written tradition extinct. Book and magazine publishing industries continued to flourish for a while alongside television and radio. Listeners to radio or viewers of TV could find themselves interrupted by an encyclopedia salesman knocking at their door. Next slide, please. Yes, that one. <laughs> How many of you owned encyclopedias? Uh, I did. My parents bought me one uh, set because they thought it would be good for our educational opportunities at home. And uh, we used to have people knocking on our door selling such things. I did this one summer myself as a summer job trying to sell encyclopedias door to door. It was uh, very harrowing and not very lucrative. But nonetheless, there was an industry of this for a time. For a time. Uh, this was where you could get your encyclopedias at home. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, the latest, uh, 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 the, you know, this, this average time spent watching television, uh, back up one slide, please, the average time uh, watching television, back up one slide, please, um, swiftly eclipsed the average time spent listening to radio and reading books. So the visual tradition born in the 1950s superseded both of its predecessors. That is the 200,000-year-old oral tradition and the 9,000-year-old written one. But the latest innovation of the written tradition, uh, advance two slides, please. Uh, one more, yeah. The, uh, uh, one may date its inception to the introduction of the IBM personal computer in 1981, spawned the digital revolution. And the evolution of the digital revolution shapes the noosphere's structures and functions as the container of the shared consciousness of humanity. In an oral tradition, people spent hours each day listening or telling uh, uh, stories. In a written tradition, people spent hours each day reading and writing. In a visual tradition, people spent hours each day watching television or movies. In a digital tradition, people spent hours each day doing all the above things but online. In addition to emailing, tweeting, gaming, shopping, scamming, gambling, investing, teaching, learning, Zooming, live streaming, and whatever else they are virtualizing today that will go virtually viral tomorrow. Indeed, if you were an alien anthropologist from another planet studying the Earth from orbital space, intercepting and measuring its many and varied electromagnetic emanations across the broadest possible spectrum, you could not fail to notice the ever-increasing volume of satellite-mediated broadband transmissions, which constitute the very fabric of the noosphere. Yet you would also notice that the patterns within these transmissions are the antithesis of randomness. They carry meaningful strings of ones and zeros that represent the variegated messages within the medium. Uh, the attractive, if not hypnotic, and addictive power of the digital tradition stems from its seamless incorporation of oral, written, and visual traditions combined. Thus, the noosphere untethers both producers and consumers of culture from spatial and temporal constraints. If you are interested in a deeper analysis of these four modes of human cultural evolution, and how they affect our cognition as a species, uh, then I would suggest that you read The Middle Way, 2nd edition, 2020. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this book uh, contains, among other things, a report card uh, that compares and contrasts these four traditions. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of their effects on four pillars of human cognition, attention span, linguistic ability, imaginative capacity, and cultural memory, and as you can see from this chart, which is uh, taken from chapter 10 of The Middle Way, the digital tradition in particular can cut both ways. It can either enhance or impoverish cognition, depending on how it is utilized. In any case, it exacts some peculiar and not altogether salutary transaction costs on those who engage with it. 
since the pandemic has compelled so many to spend so much time in the noosphere, including us today, it, it has also magnified and amplified these costs. To understand them better, consider this. Okay, could you please stop the share for now? And we'll, we'll pick it up again uh, in, in a short while. Thank you very much. So consider this. Uh, data transmitted and received in the noosphere are thus far constrained to be represented either as images, sounds, or text, or as animations embodying images, sounds, or texts. Thus, these data impinge on only three of our six human senses. Images stimulate the visual cortex, sounds, the auditory cortex, texts, the noetic cortex, or if you prefer, mentation, or our sense of thought itself. But at the same time, our other three senses, gustation, or sense of taste, olfaction, sense of smell, and tactician, sense of touch, are deactivated in the noosphere, as are pheromonic transmitters and receptors as well. Thus, and this is extremely important, thus perceptual consciousness in the noosphere is necessarily attenuated robbed of three senses that are continuously deployed in the geosphere and biosphere for purposes including socialization, acculturation, and humanization, not to mention the role of pheromones. This impoverishment of human sensory experience in the noosphere may have lasting effects on consciousness itself and ultimately on what it means to be human. Imagine sitting around a table or a hearth with family or friends sharing a meal. I mean, particularly aromatic Indian food, for example. This has been a definitive human activity since the earliest days of our species' existence. All six senses are fully engaged. Now imagine a Zoom meeting with family or friends or colleagues sharing a virtual meal. There is no possibility of any shared experience of taste, touch, or smell nor of any second-order effects on consciousness itself of a shared experience of taste, touch, or smell. So if we now inquire as to why online education for K-12 school children is proving to be such a disaster, at least in the United States it is, and I'm assuming in other countries as well, we find a significant thread of explanation in this foregoing example. For children and adolescents to develop and flourish in wholesome social and cognitive pathways, they require a full range of real spatial and real temporal interactions that engage all six senses, and not an attenuated range of virtual interactions that engage only three senses. Online education of children, and indeed online activities of adults as well, necessarily entails what amounts to sensory deprivation. Such deprivation, in turn, impedes socialization and impairs cognition. But this is only the tip of the virtual iceberg, for the noosphere is not simply a passive medium in which perceptual consciousness and its fruits are shared. The noosphere is an active and sometimes hyperactive medium that is both utilized visibly and manipulated invisibly to engage and reshape conceptual consciousness itself not only for social, educational, and entertainment purposes, but also, if not overarchingly, for commercial, ideological, and political ones, whether benign or malign. In all cases, the noosphere represents a vast new arena of contending competitive forces that seek to lure and captivate minds for as many minutes and hours as possible, and in the worst cases, to habituate, indoctrinate, and ultimately enslave them. The noosphere has fomented a cybernetic gold rush, a virtual wild west. Its prospectors and pioneers, carpetbaggers and robber barons, are all competing for timeshares in everyone's consciousness. There is nothing that human beings are capable of thinking, saying, or doing in reality that has not by now been cloned in virtuality. This was an aspiration during the formative years in the noosphere to virtualize material things. But having successfully virtualized real things, the day e ex machina behind the smoke and mirrors of cyberspace have unfortunately discovered that this process is fully reversible. They are now successfully materializing virtual things. At a personal level, 
data mining and targeted marketing are tracking individual consumers in regards to their browsing and online shopping habits, tailoring and personalizing the incessant advertisements that plague websites unless one pays with time or money to bypass or remove them. But these are merely minor annoyances or distractions akin to too many billboards cluttering an otherwise scenic highway. At a cognitive level, manipulations and distortions of data, and therefore also of consciousness, are rampant. Empirically, it is well established that consumers willingly visit and revisit virtual domains that reinforce their entrenched prejudices. This is a wholly different matter than listening repeatedly to one's favorite music or regularly eating one's favorite foodstuffs. Why? is expected, if not celebrated, in any open society. But the curating, filtering, shadow banning, and downright deep platforming of nonconformist or dissident views is the very antithesis of diversity in an open society. Rather, it is a brazen epistemic tyranny that herds consumers into the depths of a virtualized Plato's cave. The epistemic tyrants who attempt to control truth in the noosphere are therefore unwittingly creating opportunity for philosophical practitioners to emulate the Socratic tradition, to re-enter the virtual cave and help liberate its captives. We do not claim to be possessors of truths, but rather to be comparatively dispassionate inquirers who, via the time-honored Alenkic method, strive at least to expose transparent absurdities and dispel patent falsehoods. In this role, philosophers have more work to do than ever. Could you resume the share, please, with the next slide? Next one. Thank you. Recall Birch and Russell's amusing yet chilling pamphlet on the power of propaganda written in 1943, when radio and newspapers were still the leading technologies in the fabrication of news and the manipulation of public opinion. Give me an adequate army, Russell wrote, with power to provide it with more pay and better food than falls a lot of the average man, and I will undertake within 30 years to make the majority of the population believe that two and two are three, that water freezes when it gets hot and boils when it gets cold, or any other nonsense that might seem to serve the interest of the state. Nota bene, no person who did not enthusiastically accept the official doctrine would be allowed to teach or to have any position of power. This, of course, anticipates the cancel culture, which is rampant now and is being manipulated by the tech oligarchs, those tyrannosaurs of the fang. Only the very highest officials in their cups would whisper to each other what rubbish it all is, and they would laugh and drink, and, and again, this is hardly a caricature of what happens under some modern governments. I submit to you that, exacerbated by the pandemic and abetted by the relentless conversion of the noosphere into a virtualized Plato's cave, Russell's warning is hardly a caricature at all for this is happening under most, if not all, current governments, except that some of the very highest officials appear to believe their own rubbish as fervently as the indoctrinated prisoners in their virtual cave. Uh, please pause the share again. Thank you. I am sure you can see how epistemic tyranny is itself a lever of political tyranny. Many of you surely realize that the pandemic has, within two short years, become a pretext for governments of the formerly freest nations on earth to strip their citizens of supposedly inalienable civil rights, to rule by perpetual decree in defiance of their own constitutions, and to politicize medical science to justify such rule. They are utilizing the noosphere for tracking, tracing, enabling, or disabling human transactions and interactions, not because it conduces to arresting the pandemic, but because it centralizes political power and cows, if not terrorizes, citizens into compliance. After 9-11 and the subsequent spate of Islamic terror attacks across Europe, as well as in Mumbai, a widely repeated mantra declared 
we are all Israelis now. After only two years of COVID-19, it is equivalently clear that we are all mainland Chinese now. When it comes to mandating control of their own citizens, governments of the Anglophone nations, America, Australia, Britain, Canada, New Zealand, are behaving like cadet branches of the Chinese Central Party Committee in terms of authoritarian control. Police statehood aside, the unwholesome effects of the pandemic do not confine themselves to untimely deaths of loved ones and unexplained cases of long COVID. Non-medical side effects include psychological and socioeconomic debilitations of lockdowns, marks increases in alcohol abuse, drug abuse, domestic violence, and teenage suicide. There are widespread feelings of powerlessness, despair, or anger among the general populace. There are fears engendered by calculated media hysteria. While many citizens are becoming fed up with authoritarian demands of unquestioned obedience to whichever dictate du jour best serves the interests of the ruling elites, yet many remain fearful of speaking out in an increasingly politicized and punitive culture. The elites in turn exempt themselves from the very decrees they promulgate. All these problems that the pandemic has spawned, spanning every sector of society, cry out for the voices of philosophical practitioners to be heard. We must amplify the extent of our presence in the noosphere, offering counsel and facilitating discussion on all these issues in ways and from perspectives that we have been uniquely trained to provide. How each of you rises to this challenge is entirely up to you, but the movement of philosophical practice itself must move into and throughout the noosphere to keep pace with the twin developments of the digital tradition itself and its intensification by the pandemic. It is necessary and also enriching for communities of philosophical practitioners to meet in the noosphere, as we are doing here, but it is not sufficient for the continued growth of the movement. We must make our philosophical services as available in the noosphere as they were in the biosphere and geosphere, for that is where human consciousness is spending ever more of its time and ever more of its resources. Beyond this, some of you may choose to deploy yourselves as virtual public intellectuals and indeed as virtual Socratic gadflies, stinging the noospherical horses of state by posing potentially upsetting questions. For instance, Here's just a quick example, and it's not a political example, it's an epistemic one. As to accumulated knowledge, Encyclopedia Britannica has morphed into Wikipedia. But how much of wiki is true, and how much is false? Has contingent or synthetic truth become a matter of algorithmically curated neospherical consensus? Isn't that a potentially dangerous metric? But if such truths have a more robust virtual touchstone, of which noetic elements are they forged? We know that the noosphere is a product of rational consciousness, for we know its history from credible independent accounts in the oral, written, and visual traditions, now folded digitally into the noosphere itself. But if the noosphere were to become a full-blown epistemic tyranny, then this thinking of envelope of Earth a second-order product of rational consciousness meant to house a virtual record of the entire first-order output of rational consciousness would be commandeered by a cartel of ruling elites who predetermine its contents, thus exercising censorship over rational consciousness itself. That would constitute an ironic injustice, beside which mere book burnings would pale. In the Anglophone precincts of the Noosphere, and undoubtedly among those of other language groups as well. Mindless apparatchiks trumpet Orwellian slogans like diversity, by which they mean unquestioned acceptance of a monolithic political narrative as the sole permissible and incontrovertibly true account of the world's problems. This will not stand unopposed by free-thinking philosophers, for we possess one meta-truth that cannot be censored by fiat, namely that nobody governs truth itself. This happens to be the motto of the APPA, 
founded back in 1999. Nemo veritatem regit, in Latin, nobody governs truth. Not Wikipedia, not the Fang, and most assuredly not woke mobs and their propagandists and apologists. The pandemic and its accompanying intensification of authoritarian control of the noosphere can be interpreted in a variety of ways. We have already had recourse to the allegory of Plato's cave, which is obviously compelling. Perhaps one day, if and when the truth about the origins of COVID-19 come to light, we will be able to narrow the field of contending hypotheses. Meanwhile, the spectrum of our oral and written traditions provide ample food for interpretative thought about the current state of the world. Would you please resume the share, Vikash, and go to the next slide. I'm coming to the conclusion, in case you're worried that this goes on forever. Uh, our Indian friends can certainly remind us that we're inhabiting nothing more or less than Kali Yuga, uh, and that certainly provides a lot of explanatory power. Our Greek friends could remind us of the myth of Prometheus, who stole fire from the gods. Our British friends can certainly remind us of Mary Shelley's novel Frankenstein, a laboratory monster who turns on his mad scientist creator. Shelley's tale seems particularly apt, for COVID-19 makes potential Frankensteins of us all. Yes, once you're infected, you can then infect others, so we all become Frankenstein under that interpretation. Yet the origins of Frankenstein predate Mary Shelley. They lie in the Kabbalistic lore of the golem. Next slide, please. A man-made creature formed from clay. In some accounts, a golem is brought to life by inscribing on its forehead the Hebrew word emet, meaning truth. The golem then becomes responsive to its master's commands until it becomes sufficiently self-aware to disobey them. This is the Kabbalistic prototype of Frankenstein. But the golem can be deactivated by the expedient of erasing the first letter of emet, the letter aleph, from its brow. We read from right to left in Hebrew. Thus, the remaining word met, meaning dead, uh, is what causes the creature to revert to its inanimate state. Thus, the golem allegorizes those who quest after the one true vaccine that will decisively deactivate the virus. But the origins of golem are itself much older than the Kabbalah. For the first golem is none other than Adam in the Garden of Eden, the very first man whom God fashioned out of clay and animated with the breath of life. Adam and Eve likewise disobeyed their master's commands and ate of the fruit of the forbidden tree, not the tree of knowledge per se, but rather knowledge of good and evil. Our subsequent expulsion from Eden is a tale retold in every generation and no more poignantly than during this time of COVID when so many have been expelled from the geosphere and biosphere and into the noosphere. Since a man-made plague has herded us into the noosphere, I will conclude by quoting J.B.S. Haldane, a British Indian biologist, geneticist, and philosopher. Next slide, please. And last slide. Haldane portrayed the appearance of Nova Aquilae in 1918, as witnessed by three Europeans in India, looking at a great new star in the Milky Way. These were apparently all of the guests at a large dance who were interested in such matters. Amongst those who were at all competent to form views as to the origin of this cosmoclastic explosion, a most popular theory attributed it to a collision between two stars or a star and a nebula. There seem, however, to be at least two possible alternatives to this hypothesis. Perhaps it was the last judgment of some inhabited world, perhaps a too successful experiment in induced radioactivity on the part of some dwellers there. And perhaps these two hypotheses are identical. And what we were watching that evening was the detonation of a world on which too many men came out to look at the stars when they should have been dancing. While our species has indeed become capable of wreaking nuclear havoc on our own geosphere, as well as toxic havoc on our biosphere, gain-of-function viruses like COVID-19 confine their damage to the very species that created them. 
claiming its victims with a whimper instead of a bang. Perhaps Haldane would change his tune today, since what we are watching is the implosion of a socio-economic world order in which too many scientists stayed indoors tampering with genetic codes, while too many technocrats likewise remain indoors manipulating algorithms when they too should have been dancing. But now that dancing has been displaced into the noosphere, it is no longer a physical and social activity. Rather, the noosphere is a dance hall of ideas, whether in or out of step with the divine music of even-tempered consciousness. Philosophical practice seems particularly well suited to this kind of dancing, so I hope that you are eager to strut your stuff while the band plays on. The hall is thronged with displaced and desynced people whose philosophical dance cards are more empty than full. Thank you very much for your kindness, and I hope this was thought-provoking for you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Marinoff. I'm sure everyone has, uh, you know, got a lot of points to think about, ponder over. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure everyone's brain cells have been provoked <laughs> by your presentation. Um, our, uh, yeah, we have some raised hands, uh, Bala sir, but uh, we also have our chief guest of honor here. So uh, should we invite Professor Mishra? Yes, go right ahead, please. I see Pepe. I see uh, 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 certainly Pepe's hand is up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. Dr. Barit. Thank you very much, Lou, for your lecture, for your enlightening and thought-provoking lecture. And I, I have just a little question, and is a, a thought-provoking question, and where are the good news? I mean, uh, do we have something good in this uh, noetic or in, in our society made by internet? For, I, I say this because, for example, Sherry Tarkel at the MIT at the beginning said that internet was very good. Uh, after some years, she said uh, she was reclaiming conversation. This is the title of her last book because she said, uh, we don't have conversation in internet. In Europe, uh, Luciano Floridi, an Italian philosopher, uh, is working on a new philosophy uh, that is a online philosophy, because he said that we are not online and we are not offline. We are on live people. So um, my question is that one. Um, uh, what are the good news for philosophical practice because of COVID-19 and because of internet. Well, I think, I think I made this clear, at least implicitly, Pepe, in pointing out some of the problems that people face cognitively and socially because of more or less enforced participation online for hours and hours at a time. We become disembodied and we become desynchronized from real time. But this, in turn, poses opportunities, and I wanted to stress that the purpose really of highlighting these uh, these difficult cognitive and social problems that the internet poses which are being researched and continue to be researched but we as practitioners have tremendous opportunities to move our practices online even before the pandemic of course uh, platforms like zoom allow us to interact around the world i've been seeing clients for the last four or five years online more than in in real offices so the internet always offered this but because of the intensified demands for large sectors of humanity to be online so many hours a day we need to get into that space more than we are now uh, many philosophers are not up to speed with the, with the technologies. Everyone here is, but you know, and I know, lots of philosophers who still struggle with email. You know, uh, and it's high time that philosophers got closer to the leading edge. We need to take advantage of the opportunities being offered to us. We're not going to hurt people by talking to them, but we can dialogue with them in ways which they are not hearing on mainstream media. They're not getting this on YouTube. They're not getting this from whatever they're doing, you know, gaming. They're not getting this uh, from listening to whichever talking heads are propagandizing them. They're not getting this. 
we can have real discussions with them. We don't know the truth, but we can make inquiries, and that's what we do very well, yes? So I'm just saying that this pandemic, as awful as it is, is creating opportunities for us to join uh, the, the shared consciousness of the noosphere and have a bigger footprint. And that's what we're doing, Pepe. This is why APA launched its chat with the philosopher service, because we're giving people an opportunity to, to, to at least interact with somebody who's thoughtful, someone who's not necessarily going to try to indoctrinate them, someone who's going to have a sincere and authentic conversation. And I think that has more value than, than ever in light of the pandemic, okay? Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Nice to see you, by the way. <laughs> thank you so much, Professor Lu. Uh, thank you so much for this presentation. And I am very, very sure this sets a direction for philosophical counselors. Uh, now I would like to invite to share their thoughts and experience about this conference for all of us. So I would like yeah, to just invite... Just one minute, uh, Madhulika. Before yes, that, we, our uh, chief guest uh, of uh, this event, uh, Professor Sachidanand Mishra has joined. Uh, we welcome Professor Sachidanand Mishra, who is sir. the Member Secretary of Indian Council of Philosophical Research, uh, for joining us today. Uh, it is an honor to have you with us. And uh, uh, Indian Council of Philosophical Research, uh, uh, in a way, uh, is the sponsor of this event. <laughs> so uh, we, we really thank you for that. And we look forward to listening to you after this uh, feedback. Uh, uh, Madhulika, please go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, I would like to invite Professor Patrizia for an enthusiastic participation and uh, pre presentation today. So, ma'am, please share some words. Okay. Patrizia, Can you hear on. me? Can you hear me now? Yes. So, thanks for for yes for. For your feedback, Madulika, as I said before, before my presentation, uh, these three days has been so rich, so full of experience, of learning, of listening. I've, I've learned a lot, really, but not all, or only from my um, more expert colleagues or, or my friends. And I, I could quote a, a, list, a list of them, of course, because it was a honor to listen to, to Pierre Grimes and, uh, and Anthony Savori Roy, uh, the Indian professor. Uh, and, and really, it was amazing and emotionally to feel how we go towards the same direction and how we can share the same kind of vision even from different experiences, even from different backgrounds and different geography and history, but we are going all together in the same direction, which is fantastic. Listening to now, listen to Lou Marin, of course, he's, he's our maestro and, and for many of us, he's our mentor. And I, I just noticed, uh, and I knew, of course, uh, we, we can share this, like, for example, in my presentation, the, the problem of data, uh, of the complexity, or the virtual interaction instead of living experience, being in front of each other and, and sharing experience. And even in, in Pepe, in Rostoy, the same kind of feeling, the difference between virtual and, and the need of a technology, because technology make us being together today from different countries and continents with the COVID, with pandemic uh, still going on, at least here in Italy, but we are all together. So that's wonderful. And uh, another point, uh, apart from learning from experts and, and professors and academicians and, and colleagues, it's learning from students. For example, it was really, for me, interesting. Like I, I can quote Udayan, I don't know if the name, it, it was a speaker at the beginning. He quoted a, day, a, dat, a datum, a data, very interesting for us. And even referring to what Lut and, and all of you have said before, like uh, one, out of seven young person in India suffers of uh, distress, of depression. This for us is very important. And it's connected to the experience of being all the time in front of a video sometimes, or because the change of the world and, and the pandemic in course and all the problematic and env environmental problematic, the, the detachment from people and from nature, this influence a lot. And that datum is very interesting for me because it's an enormous possibility for, for a counselor. 
And another point uh, that, and, and then of course, another student, for example, Asha, he was interested in Aristotle and in, in Aquinas. And that's amazing for me, that's wonderful, because it means that we are researching and studying still now. So looking at the future, like Lou, giving the direction, analyzing this world, but we, we can have a role because we are the bridge between the past, between Plato and the future. And so it's, it's this common sense, this common feeling, and this, this, this made me really happy to have been with you. And of course, I wish to, to thank once again, Professor Bala and, uh, and Charu and Madulika and all the colleagues and Dr. Vikas for really the, the huge amount of work you have done. And I think it has been productive. The outcome is, is amazing, is amazing. And so really, and, and what can I say? I mean, the nectar is important, having known each other, having listened to each other. So this, this, is, uh, this makes uh, the work of all of us, Lumarinov with APA and all the other society and Basile and, and, the, and the Pepe and, and all the other colleagues. And, and uh, so, yes, thanks again. And uh, yes, <laughs> see you in the next quotation. Yes. Exactly, ma'am. That is exactly what I was about to say that I think we have uh, set a good relation with all of us and this is a very inclusive conference. Uh, thank you so much for your kind words. Now I would like to invite some of the students to, sh to share their experience. So, Mr. Rakshat, please come. Hello. Thank you. Uh, do I need to switch on my video or is that okay? Up to you. No issues. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. Well, I, I already feel that there's so much more that uh, I can work on regarding my own paper and presentation after this conference and a whole lot of ideas have been generated for future research and practice as well. Uh, I got uh, a lot to learn from, uh, of course, from, from uh, Marinoff's uh, presentation was mind boggling for me and there's so much of content there and so much to look forward to. But I also like, I, I I liked all the presentations, got to learn everything from, from got to learn something from each uh, presentation that I could attend. But uh, I also liked, I especially liked Dr. Raja Rosenhagen's presentation, which talked of integration of Murdoch's conception of love as non violent, just attention uh, into philosophical counseling. Dr. Neha, her presentation was very nice. Uh, Andreas's presentation, I felt, was very useful and important and unique. and uh, uh, that's basically because I do feel the need for practitioners to be out there in, in the corporate sphere because uh, as Lucer also pointed out, we cannot uh, uh, you know, separate ourselves from the reality and the fact that we are moved by these corporations in some way. And uh, to, yeah. us using Zoom and Google is just, uh, just reinforces that fact. And uh, however, I do feel like for young practitioners like me, there is a need for guidelines and so that we're not confused when we're exploring this field. And, and that issue is also tricky because uh, I feel that the issue of internal subjective autonomy of the counselor uh, is a very tricky issue. So that makes the whole thing very, you know, dicey. Uh, so overall, I think we might be new, but I think we are possibly and probably setting on a proverbial gold mine. So yeah, thank you to all the organizers. Uh, Bala sir, especially Vikas sir, and Madhurika ma'am, you were very considerate and very helpful. And thank you for arranging this beautiful experience for us. I could I could attend another three days of this. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Akshat. Uh, I'd like to invite Ms. Kajin. Hello. I'm sorry, I think I was cut off there. Oh, were you continuing something? Because I invited the next speaker. Okay, did I finish? I, I do not know. When I yeah, cut. yeah, we heard you. We heard okay, you okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. I think, uh, sir, you would have to enable conditions uh, option. Please make her a co-host. Meanwhile, I'll invite Professor Andre for his, again, also an enthusiastic participation and presentation. We have a lot of fans of your already of your work already, sir. Please come. Thank you. 
Thank you, Madulika. Madulika, thank you very much for the the kind invitation and your really kind words. Uh, I do have a few thoughts to share, and, and first of all, I think just whenever we have the opportunity to have a, a conference like this, focusing on philosophical counseling, that's already very enriching and beneficial for all of us, for anyone that participates on it. But uh, with the way in which you and I uh, congratulate and thank you all the whole team in the name of Professor Bala, the way in which you have done this is truly admirable. So much care, so much consistency. You can just see uh, the, the line up of the, the speakers and the very way in which they were set up. There is a logic, there is a, 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 an intention behind everything, it seems, that, that it has been done. So really, really thank you so much for the opportunity for, for this very enriching uh, experience in the, this conference. And uh, I would like also to congratulate and share my admiration for this Indian community of philosophical counseling that you are cultivating. It, it, looking from outside, it looks like you, you have been doing a very serious and at, at the same time humane uh, job in putting together this community. I think your community in India is a good news for all of us. We have so much to learn from you and uh, appreciate, I personally appreciate very much the way in, in which you are approaching this because you are sharing these deep and interesting uh, insights from Indian traditions of philosophy and doing the, the work of integrating that with approaches of philosophical counseling that we have from other parts of the the world. And I think that work of integration is really, really uh, useful. And I think the way in which you are approaching this says something about the international community of philosophical counseling in itself, which is very cooperative, uh, very enthusiastic, and uh, I think really, really a wonderful uh, community to be a uh, part of. And if I may, to end uh, these words, Professor Bala and the whole team in India, I have a, a suggestion to share that from this conference, we organize ourselves and start something like a um, uh, philosophical counseling day. Because uh, I think philosophical counseling has a tremendous potential to benefit people, many people from around the world, and yet so few are aware of such a possibility. So it's a very simple idea that we should pick a day in which we all uh, write articles or something in our local newspapers, magazines, blogs, social networks, just a way for all of us using our collective power to make philosophical counseling known to the world. But uh, in terms of this conference in itself, it has been a wonderful experience and I can't but thank you so much for taking the time and effort for organizing it for the benefit of all of us. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for your kind words. For sure, we should have a philosophical day, philosophical counseling day, and we, we should celebrate that. I'm very sure. Uh, yes, Professor Du. Yes, may I just add that, uh, and I wanted to say this uh, before, uh, one of the advantages, again, of the uh, connectivity forced upon us by the pandemic is that we've seen a tremendous development of the movement globally in the last few years. 
uh, in meetings of uh, international business leaders, um, there was this uh, uh, aphorism, uh, there was this uh, uh, rather uh, notion of the BRICS, you know, the, 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 develop, the leading developing nations, they called it the BRIC, um, it meaning Brazil, India, uh, uh, Russia, China, the BRIC, Brazil, Russia, India, uh, uh, China, the BRIC nations. Uh, these were rapidly developing nations, you know, were on a, on a very, very fast trajectory, uh, economically speaking. But what we have seen in the last three years is the development of philosophical practice exactly in the BRIC nations. I mean, Andre, you're doing a phenomenal job representing Brazil, and we need to have more, more voices, you know, that can join yours. But Russia did a phenomenal job, I guess Sergei is here, of hosting, uh, you know, the, uh, the ICPP meeting over two years in very trying circumstances because of the travel problems. So they did a great job, and now Russia has this emergent voice in the international community. India has, has is, is doing an unbelievable job. Hi, Sergey. And of course, uh, as I wrote Bala in, in the uh, editorial to the special issue on Indian uh, philosophical counseling, I mean, the home of philosophical counseling in the West is India. I mean, our philosophy is so much uh, tied back in time to the roots of Indian philosophy that it's a very natural thing. And as Andre said, we hope to learn from you because there is so much nuance and so much depth in Indian philosophy. You're learning from us, but we have much more to learn from you. And uh, and China is uh, and I I'm you know I'm not speaking politically now. Many friends in China. I love being in China. And China has its own indigenous philosophical traditions, and I know that Professor Ding has been in the room in addition to Li Zhang, Zhang and, and there's a tremendous ferment as well um, in various Chinese universities. Uh, they're translating many of our publications into Chinese. Uh, including those by people in attendance here. They are studying what we're doing, and they are applying uh, precepts of philosophical counseling grounded in Chinese philosophy, be it Taoism, be it Neo-Confucianism, you know, be it Buddhism, and they're doing fantastic things as well. So we have seen this tremendous uh, profusion of growth within these communities of these hugely populous developing nations, and that's an enormously uh, uh, encouraging sign for philosophical practice worldwide to have uh, Brazil, Russia, India, and China join. You know, this community in full force is going to be good for everybody. But as Andre said, some of you at least need to be public intellectuals. You have to get out there and make people realize that we don't have a political agenda. We have a philosophical mission, and we want to interact with the public, be they clients or be they in, in, in cafes or bookstores or Zoom meetings. But you've got to take this outside of our own interactions and bring it in some way to the public. However you find a way to do this, it is essential. We are growing within, but we also need to do outreach and become public advocates. Okay, that's the main thing. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for your words. Uh, Kanchan, would you like to share some last remarks about the conference? Uh, okay, I think there's some technical issue with her phone. Uh, Pikasa, over to you. Thank you very much, Madhulika. Uh, I, I think I should first formally invite again, Professor Sachidanand Mishra. Uh, and I should tell a little bit more about him. So he's a well-known academician in the areas of Indian logic and epistemology, conceptual development of Navvenyai, Advait Vedant, Shuddha Advait Vedant, uh, Kashmir Shaiva schools, and Indian aesthetics. Besides being an erudite scholar in classical philosophy, literature in Sanskrit. He is a professor of philosophy and religion at the Banaras Hindu University, Varanasi. He has authored and edited around 11 uh, books, basically in the field of Nyaya Vedanta and other areas of philosophy and Sanskrit literature. He has also edited the eminent research journal on which he, uh, he has contributed chapters in various books. And uh, I mean, he, too many publications to be uh, shared here. I, I, I invite you, sir, for uh, your uh, comments, feedbacks, reflections. 
over to you, sir. Namaste, everybody. This is indeed a pleasure to be here in this uh, conference among these scholars of philosophy and philosophical counseling. However, I would like to share one point that is, I am actually most unsuitable person to be invited in this conference for not being trained in philosophical counseling. As uh, I am student of Indian philosophy, and uh, as you became aware of my, some of my contributions, uh, I studied Navvinya, Advaita Vedanta, and also Shuddha Advaita Vedanta, and little bit of Buddhism. But uh, something I would like to share, however, I am a little bit afraid that my, what I am going to share uh, will not make any contribution. But what I understand philosophical counseling and uh, how it could be used, I would like to share with all of you. Uh, <clears throat> according to my understanding, philosophical counseling is actually an approach that inquires and helps the people in their life events, in their problems in life, which they are facing with. And here the philosopher has to do one thing to inquire how the problem is raised, what problem the person is facing, and how the person can deal with those problems. And another point is to say that uh, according to philosophical counselors, philosophy is actually a way of life. And in India, we all have studied Indian philosophy in the same way. That this is actually a way of life. There is a Nyaya way of life, there is a Buddhist way of life, there is a Vedantic way of life, there is also a Jaina way of life. And actually, these all people are living in the same way as it is propounded. There are practitioners of Jaina philosophy and there are uh, followers of Jaina philosophy, Jain religion. So here in India, we can see very clearly that the philosophies are very much a way of life because all the philosophies are founding uh, one religion. One philosophy is always associated with a different type of religion. For example, when you are talking about Jaina philosophy, there is a Jaina religion. And if there are Jaina Swedambar, Jaina philosophy, Jain, Digambar Jaina philosophy, accordingly there are two religions associated with Jaina philosophy. And also you can see when we talk about Buddhist philosophical schools, there are um, four major philosophical schools which are known traditionally. Vaibhashika, uh, Sautrantika, Yogachara and Madhyamika. They all are having uh, a way of life, how to deal with the problems and actually the whole uh, aim of Indian philosophy is to get rid of the problems we are facing in this life. So what is now understood for only uh, 20 years or 30 years as philosophical counseling, the Indian philosophers had been doing, as I understand, the same thing in a different way. And because philosophical counseling is not limited to only one way of philosophizing. It can take help from Socrates. It can take, from, take help from Aristotle. It can take help from the uh, logical positivists and modern philosoph political philosophers, John Rawls, for example. So you can take help from all the philosophical schools, philosophers. And in that way, every philosophy, what is there that can help solving in our problems. And here actually philosophical, philosoph philosophical counselors are trying to find out the way how philosophy could help in solving the problems we are facing here. 
because as western philosophy developed it actually made a departure from practical life because it was understood only a theoretical study theoretical branch of branch of learn theoretical branch of study and here experimental part was not there and we can see that if uh, the philosophical counselors are there uh, they can find out the meeting point between indian philosophy and western philosophy because they they uh, can find out some issues which are very much helpful very uh, easily explored in indian philosophical tradition and taking the help of those uh, issues those problems how they deal with and here uh, we can see that when buddha left his home he was not leaving this life he was leading this life in a different way when mahavir jain became jaina became tirthankar he was not leaving this life but leading this life in a different way and he was uh, giving some insights how to tackle the problems how to solve the problems here in 21st century this is very amazing thing to note i think that as we are progressing in materially materialistic life the problems are also uh, raising much and more day to day life and here you can see that mental issues psychological problems psychiatric problems are uh, raising day by day so here all the problems could be solved by psych psychiatrist or psychoanalysts i don't think that will be possible because there are so many problems sometimes it is very difficult for a person to accept that the person is suffering with some psycho psychiatric psychoanalytical problems and the person is nowhere and actually the problems are there that the person is not able to think clearly and the philosophers believe that many problems many of the problems could be solved if the person can think properly clearly and many problems could be solved in that way and this is i think the task of the philosophical counselors and in this way if philosophical counselors could work but this is actually very shaky ground shaky ground in the sense that it is very difficult to uh, differentiate many times what a philosophical counselor has to do and what the psychoanalyst cannot do because their psychoanalysts are also working on the same field sometimes removing the problems pointing out the problems and uh, suggesting some uh, remedy to those problems so here philosophical counselors have to think in a different way and they have to make their their way out where they are not uh, going in that direction what direction is actually left for the uh, followers of fried and some other psychoanalysts so here uh, I, because uh, with my limited knowledge i don't think i should speak too much here because i have studied only a little only a, i have seen only a few uh, articles on this topic so it will be uh, very much problematic to speak so much here uh, i uh, want to stop here thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share some ideas with all of you and uh, surely i would have been very much benefited if i could attend the whole conference but Uh, sorry to say that i could not attend the whole conference uh, so here uh, i am stopping my views thank you very much for giving me this opportunity namaste no thank you so much uh, to you sir because uh, you know icpr and your support uh, has what is uh, you know led led us to this conference and to this moment and uh, we cannot thank you enough
for being uh, the backbone of this conference in a way and for your kind and um, humble words that you have shared with all of us today. It really encourages us to keep doing what we are doing. Um, and thank you so much for being here with us today, sir. Uh, with that, I would like to invite uh, Professor Bala here. Uh, who has been, uh, you know, he hasn't uh, shared much throughout the conference, but we would like to hear some more from him. Uh, he's kind of holding the flag in India for the whole philosophical uh, counseling movement uh, in a way. So, uh, sir, we would definitely love to hear from you, each one of us. Yeah, thank you, uh, Charu, for the invite. Uh, Professor Lu, uh, as you know, a scholar, practitioner, and uh, a, a very good friend and who was very kind and also very supportive of philosophical counseling movement in India. I must say this and acknowledge this. And Professor Mishra, who is a very good friend of mine and an administrator and friends, <clears throat> he said he is not an expert in the field, but he shared his pertinent views with us, very important views. And I must tell you all that with same kind of eloquency that he spoke now, now probably more proficiency, with more proficiency, he can speak in Sanskrit with us all about philosophical counseling. So he's such a wonderful scholar uh, in Sanskrit and Navyanyaya. And Navyanyaya, when we look at that, it is basically like practicing, you know, trying to understand it in a symbolic way, what is being presented in the philosophical discourses. And in that particular sense, it also pays way for philosophical uh, uh, practice. You know? And Dr. Vikas, my uh, uh, friend and the coordinator of this uh, conference, Ms. Madhulika, Ms. Charu, and other distinguished invitees, guests, friends, supporters who have joined us today. Thank you so very much to all of you for making this conference a grand success. And it is only because of uh, all of your support that we have reached this way. I'm just trying to look back and uh, uh, I'll just speak for uh, uh, 10 minutes and then stop. Okay, I'll not talk much, but I have certain things to share with you all. I thought I, sh I should do this on this occasion. We started this conference with the idea that we would have it in the hybrid mode, at least, if not completely in the physical mode, you know, with this, in this physical space. And many participants have said, we want to come to India. We want to see the place. And unfortunately, because of this pandemic uh, and the variant of the pandemic that has come up in the recent past has made us to uh, completely abandon the idea of uh, physical uh, space meeting and then move to online mode. And that is how uh, we are all here uh, today. Uh, as I said in the beginning, on the very first day of the conference, there were three aims that we had. The theme, of course, all of you know by now, philosophical counseling, uh, um, concepts, methods, and debates. But what we had in our background when we were proposing this conference is this, that there is a, a rich amount of skepticism about philosophical counseling and philosophical practice that is existent in the air. And it is not that we just have to leave the skepticism like that, or we have to abandon it blind, uh, push it to the corner and then go ahead. No, we don't want to do that. We thought when there is a note of skepticism, we should open a platform where there can be a discussion and where there can be a conclusion, a way out. So that is how we have conceptualized this conference saying that let there be skepticism, let there be questioning. I would say it this way, friends, like this conference made me realize that we have a, a wonderful support all around. Uh, and we have two kinds of supporters, one indirect supporters and the other one direct supporters. And you know who are the indirect supporters? who are with us saying that, yes, philosophical counseling is possible. I'm saying these are indirect supporters, but you know, direct supporters, those who are arguing against it, okay, who are, who are, who are skeptical about it, they are the direct supporters of philosophical counseling because they were not being skeptical only because they want to abandon it, they want to reject it. No, they want to make us more uh, sharp in our views. So in a way, 
the the supporters who are uh, uh, arguing no who are posing the questions of the possibility of philosophical practice or philosophical counseling are the real direct supporters of this movement and i really appreciate their efforts in these three days they were there they were asking us so many questions and pushing us forward to sharpen our minds of philosophical counseling and in this uh, uh, regard uh, as uh, we all know that not everything under the sky uh, is philosophy right <laughs> not everything under the sky is philosophy but as uh, professor rp singh has said uh, but you can philosophize everything under the sky <laughs> right not everything can be philosophy but you can always philosophize everything under the sky similarly not everything is uh, everything in philosophy is uh, could be philosophical practice but uh, philosophical practice can make use of everything in philosophy philosophical practice can make use of everything in philosophy <laughs> only thing is we should know how to use that you no know, that is our uh, it is it is left to our creativity and capability to do that so uh, it should not be as uh, uh, our friend prashant would be always guarding us saying that it should not be too narrow too broad to lose its own essence you no know, that's that's where how do we reach out to that middle path is very important with regard to philosophical counseling now friends on the last day uh, even if we have some questions with regard to the possibility of philosophical practice or understanding philosophical counseling i think now we have reached a particular stage where we can say uh if there is a question about possibility or impossibility of philosophical counseling we can always say now you should stop and see that there is a practice which is existent see you can always say uh, uh, covid 19 did not come to india <laughs> but once it is inside your home you should recognize the presence of it so that is how philosophical counseling has made its presence globally during the pandemic now you cannot say that you cannot talk about the possibility or impossibility of it when it is already made its mark now what is it that we can do probably we can see how we can adapt it and uh, bring it to uh, our own uh, academic departments and make use of it and how do we help our friends like our own students to practice them and the people uh, uh, outside the academia to understand its worth this is what we can say so we have to slightly now move forward one step from possibility debating on possibility or impossibility to one more step ahead okay that is what this conference i believe has done as a big mark okay that's one thing as i said in the beginning in the on the first day the first one is skepticism i have addressed that the second one is uh, experiences okay uh because uh, in india it is still gaining its prominence it is at a very infant uh, stage uh um, nascent state we thought we should know the experiences of others see we don't have to reinvent the wheel it is if if it is already there if it is already invented and there are practitioners uh, in various parts of the world who have been practicing and who have established societies and associations mm -hmm. of philosophical practitioners practitioners and counselors and we thought we should listen to them we should also know their experiences so that that would help us how should we go forward you no know, that that would teach us how how we can go forward so with that intention we have invited our friends from uh, 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 in fact modhalika was telling me that uh in this three days friends people scholars from 31 different countries have participated in this three day event can you imagine 31 countries have participated in this conference so 36 and, uh, 36 <laughs> sorry <laughs> i'm sorry 36 countries have participated in this conference can can you imagine a bigger uh, event than this to begin the movement of philosophical counseling uh, in the best possible way uh, in india so uh, in fact there was a, a sort of a, um, a remark that i heard uh, from some of the participants saying that 
uh, uh, the conference seems to be more oriented towards Europe and West. <laughs> uh, my, my concern here is uh, when I was looking at the experiences of others, uh, it is already existent and it is already being practiced only in these areas, okay? The, in the so-called West. I don't want to go by uh, when we are talking about philosophical uh, practice or philosophy in general, uh, it, is, it would be uh, too bad, I believe, uh, to uh, stick to this dichotomy of East and West. But even then, if we consider it uh, that way, I would say it is being practiced there. So let us learn, the exp learn from their experiences and we need not accept, we can always debate, <laughs> but we have to know it. Only then you can debate and only then you can go forward. So this, is ha this has given us an opportunity to listen to the uh, uh, expertise of uh, experiences and expertise of uh, the experiences of our friends from other countries and who have kindly uh, come forward. And they were so, so, so very kind no? in knowing and, and also sharing their experiences with us. So, which, which has to be uh, really appreciated, no? When I contacted uh, uh, most of the scholars, all of them were very ready to, in fact, come here physically and participate. And some of them are ready to come on their own and participate in this conference. See, look at the kind of commitment that they have towards philosophical counseling, not about uh, uh, any uh, uh, biased kind of on philosophical counseling itself. So we also should be open in such a similar, uh, such way, such a way, uh, in a with a similar kind of attitude towards philosophical counseling. And uh, the third important thing that I said in the uh, on the first day is, uh, along with uh, uh, skepticism, addressing the skepticism and knowing the experience of others. Third one is way forward. How, do, how should we go forward? Hmm? Now that we have reached here, we also have uh, taken a stock of uh, what has happened in the various countries with their experiences. So now how should we go forward is the concern. So that's, that's what we have to uh, look at and uh, uh, debate and conceptualize the future of philosophical counseling movement. So uh, this, this is uh, one important thing, an interesting thing that we have to do, uh, which comes out glaringly uh, at the end of the conference. There are very interesting kind of questions that were raised. I'll just take two more minutes and stop. There were very interesting kind of questions that were raised in the course of the uh, three-day uh, uh, deliberations, uh, at least for the sake of... Uh, uh, the friends who have joined us only in the valedictory, I think I should mention them. Uh, one is uh, uh, the very first day, uh, Professor uh, uh, Arsi Sinha, the chairman of uh, Indian Council of Philosophical Research, has raised this question like, does philosophical counseling address social problems? Okay. And in the uh, three-day deliberations, we have understood uh, through the experiences of our friends from other countries that, yes, it does address social problems. And then uh, there is an interesting debate that uh, came out, uh, which asks whether Bhagavad Gita, uh, uh, one of the texts of Prasthanapriya of uh, Indian tradition, whether Bhagavad Gita can be seen as, or taken as a text of philosophical counseling that has come forward very glaringly with, see, it is not that we are ready to accept anything and everything blindly. We are ready to debate and let us find out whether it can be considered to be so and so. And then we also uh, had uh, a question that has come up in the way of uh, whether all philosophizing is an act of practicing philosophy. Whether all philosophizing is an act of practicing philosophy. Can we consider it that way? And whether a philosopher can be a practitioner we have Rick here, <laughs> uh, who has uh, raised this uh, question on the very first day, and Avanish has continued this. Lou, uh, Avanish, uh, I hope you remember him, and he continued that today, <laughs> whether uh, uh, a philosopher can be a practitioner, and uh, whether uh, philosophical practice is a meta-philosophy or an applied philosophy. How should we look at that? No, these, these are part of academic debate that we have to uh, engage with. Uh, what, must, what must be the aim of philosophical uh, practice? Is it money, health, or love of wisdom? 
if we go with the other, is it that we are going to lose the other, uh, remaining? And the concern for the authentic self has come up in the discussions again and again, and whether all philosophical problems are limited to or concerned with only worldviews. So these are the interesting kind of questions that have come up during the de uh, deliberations, which with um, uh, um, I am also a limited being, so I could only listen to some of the presentations. I couldn't uh, cover all the presentations, but uh, we really had engaging debates all these three days, thanks to everyone who has uh, uh, actively participated and uh, have uh, uh, come to us. Um, yeah, this is the kind of brief uh, reflection that I have with regard to the conference that I thought I should share with you all. Thank you so much. Over to you, Madhulika Acharu. Thank you so much, uh, sir. Uh, Professor Bala is always very humble and a uh, few with words. So uh, finally, we got to hear a little bit more from him about uh, this entire conference. And uh, it's really thanks to, you know, his uh, motivation and guidance that, uh, you know, all of us um, kind of uh, knew where to go. Uh, because unless you have a clear cut, um, you know, direction and a, and a strong uh, leader, uh, it's not always necessary that you, uh, you know, end up in the direction that you intended. So um, thank you, sir, for your motivation and your guidance uh, now and always. Uh, with that, I would like to invite uh, the conference um, coordinator, Dr. Vikas Baniwal, for his final thoughts as well. Uh, thank you very much, Charu. So rather than uh, final thoughts, I, I think I should um, thank everyone involved in the conference first. Uh, so uh, just, just to share with you the spread of the conference, uh, we had about 1100 registrations and uh, combining all the sessions, more than 300 people joined every day. Uh, and each session had approximately 100 participants. Our live videos have already been viewed 700 times. And uh, the number of participation uh, could have been less because of the time difference. Uh, but in, in all of this, uh, I think I should thank ICPR again who told us to have this uh, a workshop, the, sorry, this conference. The conference would not have been possible without their support. I would also like to thank Professor Sobhasina, uh, Head and Dean Department of Education, University of Delhi for her guidance. I cannot thank our keynote and plenary speakers enough for enriching us with their knowledge about philosophical counseling. I thank our chairpersons for their critical remarks on the presentations and helping us refine our knowledge. We received about 200 abstracts out of which rounds of revision. We selected the ones that were presented in the conference. I cannot thank the presenters enough for sharing their ideas, views, and experiences with us about philosophical counseling. Next, I would like to thank uh, Bala sir. I mean, we are always thanking him for guiding us, for mentoring us. Uh, and I would, also, I would also like to thank my colleagues, Charu and Madhulika for their meticulous planning and eye for detail and their hard work in the organization of this conference. I would also like to acknowledge the contribution of all the volunteers, Ishita, Pinky, Tanvir, Priya, Ankita, and Neeta, who helped us in managing and recording the proceedings of the sessions in breakout rooms. I would like to thank all the participants of this conference who have made this conference engaging. Uh, as a step further to this um, engagement of ours with philosophical counseling, uh, I'm happy to share that uh, uh, under the guidance of uh, Professor Bala, uh, we have proceeded with establishing an Indian Philosophical Practitioners Association, IPA. Uh, and, and let me just share with you the details. So this is what we have. Uh, you, you can keep checking the website, ipa.co.in for further details. But I would like to uh, request Bala sir to please uh, discuss the intent behind the conception of IPA. Sir, over to you. 
Yeah, thank you, uh, Vikas. Uh, just a few more minutes, don't, <laughs> please don't mind. Uh, uh, friends, it's like uh, uh, the, the person who is uh, with us, uh, Professor Lou Marinoff, he has been a mentor for us. And uh, three years ago, uh, I think, uh, no, two years, 2020, I contacted him and I requested him uh, that he should do something uh, 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 in order to promote philosophical counseling in India uh, to help us uh, in this endeavor. And he was very kind and he organized an first ever online philosophical counseling uh, session. And uh, uh, we uh, organized a group of uh, uh, youngsters, enthusiastic youngsters who could come for, uh, forward. And we had a training session with him. And at the end of the training session, if you remember Lou, uh, I told you that I promised you three things. No, These promises are not for you, but for ourselves. But I said these, thing, these three things to you. One is uh, bringing out a special uh, volume of uh, 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 philosophical practice, Journal of EPA, that you uh, kindly consented and supported us with. And we came out with that. Uh, I, I, I could fulfill that first promise. The second one is I told you that I would be organizing an international conference on philosophical counseling. And this is the, the, that's my second promise. And we could fulfill it for ourselves. And the third one, again, with regard to which, we also had a personal session uh, uh, sometime back uh, saying that we would be uh, planning to uh, bring out an organization uh, of philosophical practitioners in India. And uh, that's, that's so uh, this uh, organization, Indian uh, Philosophy Practitioners Association is coming up. Uh, it hasn't come up yet, but it would be coming up. But we, we are happy to share this good news with you all, friends. Uh, uh, it, it aims to bring uh, uh, philosophical practitioners of India together to consolidate ourselves in the endeavor of promoting philosophical counseling movement. And, uh, and this is required because we see that uh, the community requires it. And from the side of the philosophical academia, it is lacking. So that is how we have to bridge the gap between the community requirement and what community is looking forward to of academic academia, philosophical academia uh, has to be, uh, something has to be done in this regard. And in order to promote, yeah, sorry, because you removed it. <laughs> I was about to read that and you removed. <laughs> But anyway, that's, uh, that's the intention, promoting the philosophical practice as a way of life and also licensing between national and international organizations and individuals to promote philosophical practice, promoting indigenous philosophical systems and practices for a general well-being of all, promoting philosophical practice in various educational institutions, professional spaces, and amongst the masses and to conduct, support, and collaborate for researchers in different philosophical practice, uh, practices. This is what we, uh, a general, a broader aim of uh, this organization. We would be coming out with more focused work plan and uh, the way forward. That's, that's what I, I was telling you from the beginning, like we have to look for way forward. And this is what we are planning to do. Uh, 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 in this uh, regard. In fact, uh, when Akshat, Akshat, when uh, he was talking about, uh, he was giving the feedback, he was talking about the lack of guidelines and lack of uh, training centers, etc. So this is how we should uh, um, um, put our first step so that uh, we can, we can um, create a space where training can be provided to the youngsters because they are all looking forward to such kind of uh, spaces. And the seed that you have uh, sowed, uh, Lou, uh, now it is coming up slowly. So thanks to you uh, uh, for your support uh, um, a lot. And uh, friends, with regard to this conference, the support that I got from international uh, uh, community of philosophical practitioners is immense. And I, I, I don't know how to thank them. Uh, they, they just came forward and participated in this event. Thanks to all of them. And there is just one more thing, friends. Uh, 
most of most of you are praising this conference and uh, i think all the credit goes to vikas madhulika and charu they have done a lot of hard work i, I am only a, a, a rubber stamp <laughs> okay <laughs> they are the ones who have really put their uh, hours of time together to make this conference success if there are any lapses they are mine it is only i could not guide them properly that is how you would find the lapses but otherwise the success the credit of the success must go to these three i uh, thank you uh, vikas thank you mathulika and thank you charu thanks to all of you namaste